Um, if we'd like to go ahead and get started, I think most of the folks who are going to be speaking today are here. We may have some more folks come in, but that's fine. They can filter in as we move forward. I'm Brandon Davis. I'm the Executive Director of the Northern Shenandoah Valley Regional Commission. I know many of you in this room don't know all, so I look forward to getting to know you. Um, this bug is uh, now in our area, and if we are going to be able to react to it or even try to be proactive, we have to understand it. We have folks at the, the state level as well as at some of the local areas who are becoming experts and some who are already experts on this. But as it spreads through the Northern Valley, I feel like it's going to be important for our local leaders in the communities to fully understand the impacts, learn from others' mistakes so we don't repeat them. Um, to that end, Felicia Hart with uh, Town Front Royal and Jeffrey Brown with the Warren County EDA uh, asked me to put together this event and they helped me stand it up and think through what, what it would look like and reach out to folks to, to see who all would want to be here to learn about it. Uh, so I appreciate them providing the impetus for this and I hope we all learn something from this today. Um, I'll introduce that and, and then move forward. Uh, Mark, you want to come on up and get started? Or? Sure. We, can, uh, we have a flexible agenda in front of us and we can adjust it as you see fit. Mark is with the Virginia Cooperative Extension and I'll let you introduce yourself a little better. I didn't do a lot of bios. I expect this to be somewhat informal um, just because that's my style and I think it's, it would be valuable for us to be able to ask questions throughout it as long as the presenters are okay with that. Mark? Certainly. Well, thank you, Brandon. Absolutely. And thanks for organizing this. I think I'll stand stand back here to interact with you you all a little bit um, hopefully you can see the screen and I'll use that just as prompting and to show some photos there are lots of handouts Amanda Bly with Virginia Department of Ag brought some uh, publications and handouts and I brought some they're on both sides here we also have uh, some Riker mounts and samples that we can pass around so you guys can see Amanda would you mind maybe grabbing those and just sending them around so folks yeah, sure. Folks can see the the Riker mounts and um, the actual vials as we as we talk about this insect. So, spotted lanternfly. Yes. Um, well, let me introduce myself uh, uh, officially. I'm Mark Suffin. I'm with Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm housed in the Frederick County office uh, in downtown Winchester, but work and serve a five-county region here in the northern Shenandoah Valley. So. Um, you know, the, the five counties that the Regional Commission serves of Clark, Frederick, Warren, Shenandoah, and Page. Um, this insect showed up uh, in the United States in the Pennsylvania area, southeast Pennsylvania, in 2014. Unfortunately, it made its way to Virginia and was discovered in January of 2018 in Frederick County. Um, we are the second known population in the United States. So uh, that's, that's not a good distinction to have. The name Spotted Lanternfly, um, not a fly at all. Many of the photos that you'll see are this beautiful insect with the wings wide open. It looks a lot like a butterfly or a moth. It is not. Um, it's actually a plant hopper. So they're piercing sucking insects. They uh, tap into the plant host species that they're feeding on and drink the sap, the phloem, out of, out of the host plant. Um, so we'll go through that. I'm giving credit to Eric Day and Teresa Dellinger. They um, were instrumental in putting together this presentation and the slides. They manage our insect ID lab uh, at Virginia Tech uh, on main campus. So I can't take credit for that feature either. That's, that's their doing. This map is probably going to be difficult for you all to see um, at its scale, but it gives a sense of the known population area in the United States. Um, the pest and the concern is the fact that this is going to be an issue um, on multiple levels. It's an issue for ag production. Uh, primarily grape growers is our, our greatest concern, possibly tree fruit, apples, peaches, cherries, uh, a few other fruit crops, um, potentially hops, although we're not positive on that one, and uh, a, a few other ag crops. It's also going to be a forest pest because it likes things like black walnut, maples, and a few others. 
that are that are important to the timber industry and then it's a nuisance in the home landscape um, as i said these are piercing sucking insects they're drinking the sap out of the tree i'll have some photos that you'll see of how they aggregate together in high numbers and when you have large numbers of piercing sucking insects that are relatively large um, I often equate them to something like an aphid population. Unfortunately, these aphids are the size of your thumb and they're constantly excreting their waste, which we call honeydew. And so that coats the surface underneath of them. Um, and so you've got the gross factor with the number of insects, you've got the gross factor with the honeydew and a, a sooty mold that develops. And so it becomes a nuisance in the home landscape um, as well. But back to where we, this, this is just updated January 10th, 2020. Uh, unfortunately, this map keeps changing. It seems like every, every month or every few months. So um, there's always new information and unfortunately new finds because this pest is a great hitchhiker. It moves around readily with human assistance at all life stages. I, I said that Pennsylvania was unfortunately the winner at um, finding this pest first in Berks County near Reading and Allentown in 2014. As you can tell, it was initially in one county. It has now spread, um, I believe, to 14 counties in Pennsylvania, eight or so in New Jersey, one in Delaware, and two in Maryland. Um, of course, the find in Winchester, Frederick County in 2018 and then towards the end of 2019, it was picked up uh, just across Opecan Creek into Clark County, and then also to the north of us in Berkeley up near Bunker Hill. Um, so that's, that's the blue areas that are defined on this map. Um, the blue areas that are outlined in red are under state quarantines for this insect, and Amanda will talk more about the quarantine and regulatory side of this. And the yellows uh, often are, um, or create some confusion. Those are areas where the insect has been intercepted and not really a, a breeding population is present. So most of those are transportation inter intercepts or someone visited the Pennsylvania area and brought one home with them um, and, and only a single insect was found in many of those cases. So. You can see on the map, we've got Madison and Falk here in yellow, where there were, were some transportation intercepts in those counties. <clears throat> Talking again a little bit about our population in Winchester, Frederick County, first found January 10th, 2018 by Tom Carey with Virginia Department of Ag, uh, a plant health inspector looking for this insect. That was actually what he was out doing. Um, went to a property that was uh, a potential risk in Frederick County because of some trace forwards from the original detection in Pennsylvania and unfortunately did find the insect present in, in January of 2018. They did some surveys and this will show you more uh, where the heart of that infestation began just on the north side of Winchester, delimiting it more to um, about a one by one mile area. Unfortunately, it has not stayed put uh, despite efforts that Amanda will talk about from Virginia Department of Ag and the United States Department uh, of Ag. Uh, this is some of their data. She'll present some more current data, but um, just to orient you, this is Interstate 81 running north and south. This is the Virginia, West Virginia border to the north. Opecan Creek dividing Frederick with Clark uh, and uh, as you can say, see we've picked it up or VDAX has picked it up all the way to the border along 11 and 81. Pretty much the entire eastern side of Frederick County all the way to Opecan Creek um, and then farther south. Again showing the known infestation in Frederick County and that original one by one mile area, we're now pushing 60, 65 square miles of known infestation um, in, in two years growing from one square mile to, to 60 couple. 
It has been picked up at Frederick County Landfill. We went there intentionally looking for that as a high-risk site, um, thinking that the insect could travel there in brush debris or other, other waste. Uh, it's not necessarily believed that that's a breeding population there. There were only some, some juveniles picked up in, in the spring of 19. And then uh, a few transportation intercepts down kind of along 81 in the Middletown area. Um, we're not sure whether those were from our population in Frederick County uh, or up in Pennsylvania. Who knows, but unfortunately this, again, this insect is a great hitchhiker and can move around um, pretty easily. I'll talk a little bit about the insect, the life stages. You've seen the Riker mounts that are going around to actually see specimens. The hardest stage to really identify and understand is the egg mass stage. That's what we're in currently. That is the stage that overwinters. Um, it's late in the fall. They live as eggs in the egg mass over, over winter and then hatch late April, early May into these juvenile stages. There are four juvenile stages. The first three are black and white um, that are shown here. The small black and white nymphs or instars, one, two, and three. They, they grow in size a little bit, as you can see. Um, they are a deep black. I know the ones in the vial are faded and it's hard to see this, but when you see them in the natural environment, um, they're pretty obvious. The, the, the body is deep black, the white is bright, bright white, and they stand out. They do not fly at this stage. They crawl and they can jump. They can jump really well. I've seen some of the smallest nymphal stages jump six or eight feet just from a standstill. So as you're walking along or you're, you're in and amongst the population, they can scatter pretty quickly and, and quite, quite far actually. <clears throat> These are photos showing some of how they aggregate, how they feed in the younger stages. Both of these photos are from Frederick County, Virginia, unfortunately. Uh, on the left is a wild grape. On the right is Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus altissima. That um, the Ilanthus, or Tree of Heaven, is their favorite or preferred host. And that too is a weedy, invasive species from Asia where uh, spotted lanternfly is, is native to. Uh, spotted lanternfly is native to China, Bangladesh, Vietnam region of Asia. It has been a pest in South Korea as well as in Japan and um, obviously now here in the United States. At these younger stages, they feed on a wider range of hosts, uh, but those are their two favorites right there, Tree of Heaven and Grape. Um, and they are feeding, as you can see, on the new tender growth of the plant out on the end. That's where you'll typically find them. As the insects mature, then you'll see them feeding on harder woody tissue uh, on larger plants and different species. The fourth juvenile stage, or the fourth instar, is uh, this bright red nymph. It's a little bit larger, um, nearly a half inch long in size. Again, these do not fly. They can still jump really well. And some of the host species that we typically find these on include still Tree of Heaven, obviously. Grape is a hot, hot one. But Black Walnut at this stage, for some reason, and it's not yet known, uh, is, is a favorite host during the fourth instar stage. Again, where to find it? Grape, Virginia Creeper, in and around um, Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus altissima is typically where we're finding this. And if they would just stick to the Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive weed species, um, it really wouldn't necessarily be as big of a deal. But as I alluded, they, they have the potential to impact agriculture, the forest industry, and forest and timber industry, and um, just be a flat out nuisance in the home landscape. The adults, we see these emerging mid-July. Um, they're pretty large for an insect, about one inch from, from head to tip of wing. 
when they're flying or when they're um, potentially dying from an insecticide treatment or when they are startled and, and tr trying to defend themselves or, or show their bright colors, that's when you see those underwings. The bright orange, reddish color underwing, um, we believe is a predatory defense to, to scare away predators. They're feeding on tree of heaven, picking up chemicals from that tree that make them taste bad to, to animals um, and predators that may, may be interested in eating them. It's at this stage that they do actually fly. Um, much of the literature and really from an entomology standpoint, we, uh, or it's often said they're poor flyers. Unfortunately, they do they still can fly fairly well and can disperse some that way, uh, but the greatest threat still is human-assisted movement of these insects. Just a few photos of them out feeding. Damage that they can actually do to the plant material. We'll see um, Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut starting to flag. That's the tips of the branches wilting from so much sap being uh, taken out of the tree. And, and they'll die and, and kind of wilt. There on the right is a small black walnut that's actually um, one of the heaviest aggregations I've seen, and they were all fourth end star uh, in the Frederick County area and, and really causing leaves to drop on that whole tree. Again, aggregation, this is what's possible. Um, on the left is an ornamental cherry tree in someone's backyard in Pennsylvania. I don't know too many individuals who would be okay with this situation based on the number of insects. And then also, as I alluded, they, they secrete um, and, and, and excrete honeydew, which is their waste. They're drinking so much sap, so much phloem from the host tree. Um, and having to process so much to get the nutrients they need that th they just literally rain down honeydew out of, out of a heavily uh, infested tree. So if you've got young children, play equipment around, it's getting coated with honeydew. Um, additionally, a, a fungal growth called sooty mold starts to grow on that honeydew. On the top right, uh, that's also from Pennsylvania in, in a wine grape vineyard. Adult lanternflies feeding quite heavily on the vines. Bottom right, um, again on Tree of Heaven. And it's, it's pretty bright in here. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this. This is a, a video happening actually there. Um, and what it's showing this is a backyard in Winchester, Virginia, um, with a heavy infestation of lanternflies in those trees that you can see the trunks are up in the canopy. And the afternoon that I visited this, this residential yard, it was literally raining down. Um, typically when I'm working in the infestation area, I'm cleaning off my glasses. Um, but this video showed like 10 streams of waste just running down at one time. So you're literally walking in it as, as you're underneath um, an infested tree. Again, sooty mold um, turns black and covers uh, the forest floor, covers underneath the, the area infested, covers the plant material. Um, in the ag setting, this uh, further reduces photosynthesis and can further weaken uh, the grapevine or whatever crop um, that they're infesting. We also start to see, you see some white patches growing on this tree trunk. That's a yeast or fermentation <coughs> growing um, just from so much sap and honeydew um, oozing out of that tree from all the puncture wounds. And you get this, uh, again, yeast vinegar smell in the air, um, in the area. More pictures of sooty mold. Um, and the, the other side effect that comes with the honeydew is it starts attracting um, other insects that may want to feed on that honeydew. Um, this is showing a yellow jacket here on the right. 
The photo on the left is poor quality, but again, that's a, a residence backyard um, in Winchester, Frederick County. And the individual, young couple with young kids, children in the backyard had reached out to a beekeeper um, thinking they had a honeybee swarm in their tree. The beekeeper came out said, no ma'am, you don't have a, a honeybee swarm, you have a lanternfly population. And at that time, the beekeeper brought me into the situation. But there were literally hundreds of bees, honeybees, bumblebees, yellow jackets, um, ants, things like that attracted to this area. Not a favorable environment uh, for young kids and, and pets. Again, you'll see that white fungal uh, yeast growing at the base of the tree there, just from heavy, heavy population. Egg masses, um, those are um, late in the fall. They start showing up in the mid-September time frame, typically laid on the underside of a horizontal branch is where we typically see them most frequently. Um, higher populations, they, they are way out on smaller twigs like is shown in this photo or um, again, brought down on the trunk at human height, on posts, whatever's in the area of the heavy population. Here's some more photos. Um, I think all of these, again, from the Frederick County area on the left is a piece of concrete with five egg masses on it. They can be anywhere from gray to tan to off-white. As they age, they change in color and dry and crack out on an abandoned tractor trailer. It's just covered. For some reason, they like rusty metal to lay their egg masses on. And as you can see, moving something like that then <clears throat> creates a risk and has potential to, to start a whole new population somewhere else. So is it one female that's laying each of those egg masses? Or can one female lay numerous egg masses? Um, we believe a female can lay upwards of three to five egg masses in her lifetime. So it's one life cycle per year. Uh, an adult female can lay up to five egg masses. Each egg mass ranging somewhere 20, 30, 35 eggs per egg mass. Um, so pretty high, pretty high population boost can happen pretty quick. Mark, you've got a lot of nice rusting metal outside here in the parking lot. Um, possible to have transmit from here anywhere in the world or in obviously mm -hmm. um is that something y'all are concerned about as far i mean obviously you're worried about the tractor trailer moving up and down the highways but yeah yeah in fact um tina mcintyre with virginia department of ag arranged a meeting here with the port um i forget now when it was i don't know if anyone if you guys remember um Tina McIntyre with Virginia Department of Ag, she invited me and we gave a presentation to the staff here. Look out for um, please. Yes, uh, it's presently not known to be right here. Um, I think Amanda will show some more maps that'll give you exact pinpoints of where we're seeing the insect. But again, who knows where it's moving. Um, and a lot of it is just raising awareness, making it known to you all as leaders in the community, making it known to the general public. Um, more eyes out there so that we can uh, be aware of where it is and try to try to reduce the spread and knock back the population as quickly as possible. You're known too about a lot of this is a lot of fruit population in these like denser areas in Winchester. Here in Warren County we have a lot of federal land like the Shenandoah National Park and George Washington National Forest that people aren't you know in every acre. Right. Is there, you know, you guys working with them as well, I assume, to, you know, check all those populations? And yeah, so Virginia Department of Ag, as well as Virginia Cooperative Extension, have been talking about this insect since it was first found in Pennsylvania, um, you know, in 2014. So most of our educational meetings from 2015 on, we've been talking about this insect, letting farmers and growers and um, folks in the lawn and landscape industry know about it, and certainly when it... It, there was a positive find um, in, in January of 18. We ramped up efforts. Uh, Park Service and others have been involved with some of the meetings that we do and trying to get the word out. So we're doing what we can. Um, you know, you're, you're pointing out some of the, some of the many hurdles uh, that are out there in, in dealing with it. 
Again, some more photos of egg masses. Uh, it, it, it can be difficult to, to see them. They can be quite cryptic. There's an egg mass and there's an egg mass um, hiding on a tree of heaven. Uh, some non-plant egg sites, again, for some reason liking rusty metal surfaces, uh, surfaces quite a bit. Showing the age progression of an egg mass as it weathers through the winter. That covering, um, uh, we believe it gives some protection to the eggs against predators and, and maybe some other, other benefits. It, there's still a lot to learn about this insect, a lot to understand on how to best control it and best management. Um, lots of work is being done in the Mid-Atlantic with numerous universities and departments of ag and the USDA um, just to, to try to understand this and, 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 and really play catch up. Host list, I'm not going to dwell on this, but it, but it ranges from um, ornamentals to uh, native forest species to some ag crops that we have actually seen them feeding on or laying eggs on in Winchester and Frederick County. And um, lots of publications can be found that Virginia Cooperative Extension has put together. I have quite a few of those up here. Uh, a few of them are even in Spanish. And if you need more resources, if you do an online search for Spotted Lanternfly Virginia, um, it's usually the first or second hit that comes up is the Virginia Cooperative Extension Spotted Lanternfly main page, and, and you can get all of these resources. We also have a portal there on that page that is where you can report a finding. We're happy to learn about it. Even if it's, even if it's not a lanternfly, we're happy to get a report so that we can confirm where it is or where it isn't. We communicate almost on a daily basis with Virginia Department of Ag and the team that's in the Winchester Frederick County area and you'll hear more from Amanda about that. Um, but really just trying to stay on top of where this is, where it's spreading and, and notify folks. To date, we have not really seen it in commercial ag production in Winchester and Frederick County. It has largely been in industrial and residential areas. Um, so for our, for our farmers, that has been good, but we know it's right on their doorstep, right around some commercial orchards, uh, and, and time will tell how much of an impact it, it's actually going to have. So, any further questions? Mark, I would ask, the, the pop-up that you have here, could we, I'd love to have something like that to be able to put in our town hall, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of people coming in to pay bills, and, and probably in Warren County, um, in the government center. Are those available? That, I mean, we'd be willing to pay for something like um, that. Because it's a great way to get attention. Yeah, it, it's a catchy banner. Uh, I'm sure we could work something out. Okay. So uh, I've got business cards over here if Perfect. anybody needs my contact information, email, cell phone, office number on that. So just hit me up if you have questions. I'll, our, um, our State Master Gardener office in Blacksburg is actually who printed a couple of those signs for us to use as educational displays. but. Um, okay. We'd be happy to get some more okay. printed up and figure out. Yeah, because we can we can pass them around to the library, the community center, all of those yeah. group meetings. That'd places. be great. Yes. Okay. Great. I have a question. Sure. We're in Page County. We're trying to encourage industrial hemp growth. Has that is that going to go into that crop? As <laughs> <laughs> I start to encourage people to grow hemp. <laughs> It, it may. That's, that's uh, an unknown. I know we have some researchers at Virginia Tech who reached out to me as soon as this was found. They're like, do you have any hemp in Frederick County within the known population where we can study if it's going to be on hemp? Because hemp is related to hops. Um, it's, been, it's been advertised or publicized that, that hops are at risk. Um, I've seen some conflicting data and information on that, so hops may be okay. Um, so unfortunately, we really don't know yet. Okay. Not but for as, sure. as I have conversations with growers, this is what I can mention to look out for. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Anybody else? Mark, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you coming to share your expertise. I assume you're going to hang around if, if any yeah, uh, questions arise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my hope next, next is to have some local impact 
uh, discussion about what it's really looked like in specifically Winchester and maybe in the winery industry, and then save Amanda Bly for last to talk about how we're fighting back and how what what options we have and what the prognosis really is. Um, so if if you all wouldn't mind coming forward and, and just talk for a few minutes about your experiences and what you've what you've done so far, just keep it informal if if you'd like, or be as formal as you would. Uh, Kim Herbstritt, a council member from the city of Winchester and a number of other uh, endeavors, <laughs> and Loretta Breda <laughs> with the wine industry. Yes. Come on up if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks, Brandon, and thanks, Mark. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not sure why the spider lanternfly decided to pick my property to lay its eggs on. Uh, but it did, and of all the council members, I was fortunate to be the one that um, had spotted lanternfly. So I have personal experience with the challenges of trying to deal with spotted lanternfly. And um, I think, you know, Mark and uh, Virginia Department of Ag and the researchers are all working hard to tr try and figure out how does this thing move, where is it going, how do we get rid of it. Um, I mean, there's a a great collaboration and partnership, I think, that's going on to really try and figure that out. Um, the City of Winchester uh, City Council had um, our arborist come in and do a presentation to Council on Spotted Lanternfly. Um, there's certainly a lot of um, potential impacts. I've, when I've talked with um, folks about it after the experience that I had, um, I mean, I am very concerned for our uh, great our vineyards in our orchards. Um, I think that there's, as, as Mark said, I think it's just right on the edge. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something to be really concerned about. Um, some of the stuff that Winchester's been doing is building partnerships, um, you know, trying to figure out where, you know, what do we need to be doing? How can we be proactive? Can we be proactive? Um, there has been a lot of work to inventory and to get rid of the small tree of heaven, the Alanthus, um, that has been shown to be a host. So can we pull some of that stuff, get rid of some of that stuff to, to, to pull down the, the, the host um, that is available for the spider lanternfly? Um, I can say that on my property, I don't have spotted lanternfly. I have um, mulberry tree, which it laid the eggs on the mulberry tree and then a grapevine growing over it. So um, I think from an education standpoint is one of the things is to make sure that people, although Alanthus Tree of Heaven is kind of the host, is to make sure that property owners know that if you don't have Alanthus on your property doesn't mean that you might not have spotted lanternfly. So I think we need to be, you know, doing a good job of educating and informing our community members. Um, Winchester is also... Um, working on doing outreach and education. I think that there's, like I just said, there's a lot that we need to be doing around that. I think there needs to be ongoing, rigorous, regular communications with our community members. Um, I know I've talked with neighbors and residents that are like, well, this isn't a problem for me. I mean, I don't, like, what do I care? Well, we all need to care because of our, you know, agriculture in the region. Um, and even beyond, I mean, we could, you know, it could end up somewhere else. Um, it came here from Pennsylvania, so um, I think we want to be proactive in preventing it from going somewhere else. Um, so we all need the care. I talked about the inventory, the treatment. Um, I know that there, in some of the targeted areas, there were letters that went out to property owners asking permission to go and actually um, spray or deal with the Tree of uh, Heaven. Um, to address any, you know, be proactive um, with the um, with the spider lanternfly. Um, just a couple of things that, and I think I've mentioned this to Mark, just for, for those of you that um, I know Felicia's uh, going to talk about outreach and education. Is, um, but I know that people that I had talked with that got the letter or are concerned about, you know, the prevention or the treatment of this pest, how is it going to impact pets? So if you come on my property and you're going to spray, how's that going to impact my, what are you spraying with and how's that going to impact my animals? Um, I think that's a really important thing when we're doing education. There's a lot of people out there that, whether it's farm animals or dogs, cats, whatever. Um, and um, 
the other thing I've heard too is when we talk about spraying is like how's that going to impact what's the chemical that's used and how's that going to impact um, the actual fruit, the, the grapes or the apples or the cherries. Um, and so, you know, Winchester's, uh, you know, working hard to be proactive on this. Um, there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done. I think right now we need to be doing a big campaign to make sure that people, it's not, you know, just because it's not in its nymph or adult stage, but we need to be looking for eggs. And, you know, um, I, I went through the training, the, the certification that the, the state has. Um, and I would encourage you all to just kind of go through it. It's a great educational information just to kind of know what to look for, where to look for it, and be able to be knowledgeable about that and share it with other, other um, colleagues and folks in the community. So um, I'm very concerned about the impacts that this is going to potentially have for our, our certainly our vineyards and our orchards. Um, pass it to you. Thank you. <laughs> Brandon, thank you, and Mark, thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Loretta Bride, and I am the owner of the Bride Family Vineyards. We're lucky to be the most northern Virgin, uh, Virginia winery. Um, so we're closest, I guess, to all that outbreak. Um, we did uh, find, they did find some um, infestation not too, too far from our farm. But as of yet, we have not found anything on our farm. Um, our original farming practices started as biodynamic and organic, which means we did not spray insecticides at all. Um, and then um, for reasons other than insect, uh, for funguses, we lost a, a tire crop failure in 2018, so we had to vacate organic. Um, I'm just telling you this to give you a little bit history on, on how we operate as a farm. Um, our county is under a quarantine and, uh, because of the lanternfly, and, uh, as well as our farm. And uh, we completed the required training by the state, uh, and we have permits. And I do inspect vehicles, trailers, uh, anything that's coming in, especially on a commercial level, uh, to and from our farm. Um, there's an actual sheet of paper that we check off and we actually put that in to the vehicle. Um, our farm consists of 25 acres, uh, which six are under vine. We are a very small producer. Most of our varietals are hybrids. Um, we have about 5% on our farm of all the trees, which is about 25% that are tree of heaven. Um, to date, we have not seen evidence of the lanternfly in the vineyard or around our farm. And we do check because of the severity of it. Um, it doesn't mean that because we haven't seen it on our particular farm that it's not producing outside of our limits, like 20 feet outside of where I'm looking. Uh, but our particular area doesn't have it as of yet. Or at least I haven't found it. Um, the impact, that's a question that, you know, every uh, vineyard's going to be different considering the amount of investment you have. I can only speak from us, from a small vineyard, um, and um, it takes about four years to grow a grape plant and um, to produce it where it's going to produce a harvest for you for some wine. And without grapes, we have no wine production. And as you all know, the state is huge and huge investment in tourism and so forth in um, great production. Um, most wines take at least a year before we can bottle and produce them. So if you add that to the four years, if I were to have a damage to my crop, it would be five years without income. Um, on my farm, which is small, like I said, the replacement plants just on the six acres would cost about $16,000 if I had to replant that. Um, I don't know how many vineyards could stay in business, especially some of the large ones, uh, for their crops, uh, if any kind of loss on those crops were to be substantial. Um, perhaps vineyards with large inventories might 
uh, not like myself, which is a small producer, would have to wait. They wouldn't have to wait five years. They would have enough inventory and would be able to sustain them. But I guarantee you that would affect the amount of people they employ, and it, the, the trickle-down is incredible um, when you think of it. Um, and, it, and it will cause financial hardship. There's no way around that. Our personal investment in our farm and winery in the last seven years has been $850,000. That's in buildings and the land and operational costs. That's a fair amount to lose uh, for a small business. Um, and, and like I said, I keep telling you, we're, we're small. They're not, we're not the big vineyards that have a lot more to lose. We check our vines every day. We go into our vineyard all the time because we're small enough to do that. Some of the big, bigger vineyards may not. They may not check every parcel of land. Um, uh, we have, I guess, what is it, 267? You probably know these numbers better. 300 vineyards in the state of Virginia. And... Um, employing people, paying taxes, not to mention the tourism and how many people come out to see these beautiful vines. Um, our vineyards are such a part of the Virginia landscape and revenue and tourism. While we have been a biodynamic and organic vineyard most of the time, uh, we have housed a very vibrant insectiary because of our farming practices. And we house beneficial insects and wheel bug, praying mantis, and these are very aggressive predator bugs, and we have a quarter acre that flanks our vineyard where we have these uh, predatory bugs and a habitat for them. Um, I don't know um, if this has any bearing on why the lanternfly has not entered my vineyard or not, because to date, I don't think we have a predatory bug for the lanternfly, right, uh, that we know of. Not specialized. Not, not that we know of. Um, but like I said, I do house some very aggressive bugs on my property. Um, I believe our county has taken the appropriate action and measures to eliminate the lantern fly uh, as a grape grower. And given it what it's at stake for the industry, uh, I think we can't be um, too vigilant over it. Um, the... Uh, um, Wine, I want to leave you with one thought. Um, wine begins in the soil and in the, gra in the uh, plants themselves. And any time there's a damage to our vines, um, we re the result is low crop yields and also quality of fruit. And if Virginia is going to be on the map to make world-class and quality wines, we need to protect our vineyards and our plants. And... Um, Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions uh, as far as grape growing? The, the, the other thing that I would just mention is, and I'm sure Mark would be happy to, to help out with this, is I know having had the spider lantern fly on my property that um, it almost takes an eye to begin to see these things. So I, I would... I would encourage you to reach out to Mark, and if you have the time, if you know where there's some eggs, when they have the nymphs start to hatch, to go and actually see them, because it's like you have to train your eye to actually see these things. Um, and if you've never seen them before, it's, I don't know, I mean, I just found it like I, I was watching the, the, the tree that it was in, and I mean, I'd be like, oh, there's one, and... You know, and then there's only one. And, but when you start to see one, then you really look and you start seeing more and more and more and more. And before you know it, your eye is totally trained to kind of see it. So um, I would just, and I'm sure Mark would be happy to take on a little tour for spotted lantern flies. So. Thank you both very much for yeah, being here. We really up. appreciate it. So next we have Amanda Bly. She is with VDAX. And... Um, She's the one fighting back. <laughs> okay, yeah, Tell us about what's going on. Yeah, I think a, a lot of what I have to say will probably echo some of what you've already heard, which I think is okay. It's okay to hear important things more than once. Um, my name's Amanda Blatt. I'm an inspector for this region for Warren County, as well as sort of this whole corner. So I have Frederick Shenandoah. 
um, Clark, Rappahannock Page, and the northern half of Rockingham. I think that's all of them. I feel like I always forget one. Um, my supervisor couldn't be here today to join me, but um, we do have Dana Burton in the back. Uh, I can't wait to point her out. If you just raise your hand, or will you stand up for a second? Uh, Dana is the Spotted Lantern Fly Field Coordinator, so there's truly no one out there who knows more about what's going on than Dana. She's been there since the beginning. She is the person on the ground. She's helping. This project is one that it changes day to day, hour to hour, week to week. As as we learn more, as as we sort of like develop new tools and new strategies. Um, it's always changing, so we thank her and everybody for their hard work on rolling with those changes and in doing an amazing amount. We would kind of be nothing without them. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to cover two main topics. I just want to sort of an overview of the treatment program we have right now and then also talk about the quarantine, so I'm glad that she had already introduced that idea. Um, as, as she spoke to and as Mark spoke to, the, the risk is significant. Um, it's a hard thing to quantify. Obviously we have a, a really strong wine industry here in Virginia. We are often ranked fifth in, among states for wine production and not to mention apples and peaches and now the growing industry of breweries and hops and that sort of thing. So it's a hard thing to put a number on, but Mark did just share a publication with me yesterday. If anyone's interested, it's called uh, Scientists Examine Potential Economic Impact of Spotted Lanternfly in Pennsylvania. And the numbers were staggering. The, they had done estimates based on kind of like where they are now and then some predictions and the ranges of those losses were between 300 and upwards of 500 million dollars for an economic impact to the state so it was nothing to annually annually yeah not total but just annually um so yeah let that sink in uh again just the the congregating power of these insects and mark already talked about this um I think this really highlights the true importance of getting ahead of it and doing what we have the most we can absolutely do to be proactive, and like everyone is saying, because once you get to the level of an enormous infestation, there it becomes almost like there's little you can do. I've heard stories from Pennsylvania and I've read articles where vineyards were in a heavily infested area. They did apply it insecticides and the insecticides did work, but they killed the first wave and then the next wave came, you know what I mean? And so they were experiencing upwards of 80 to 90% vine loss, and, and that's enough to put someone out of business, as you can imagine. Okay, so this is a, this is a picture that you will not be able to see of our current treatment area. Does this have a little line? Yeah, it's green. Oh. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, the northernmost, is here at the West Virginia line and we there's been an alleged sighting of one in Bunker Hill but as far as our surveys show we have one really close to the line we haven't found one just over down to Stephen City uh, approximately let I guess like south of the um, Appaland West Point would be roughly like Walmart on Route 50 and then east as Mark said to the Clark County line and into the into Clark County uh, this is just the prog progression of the amount of land over the last three years since it was we kind of are just celebrating a two-year anniversary because it was found in January of 2018 and so here we are in 2020 with 40,000 acres. Um, the, oh yeah, put this note in here, the main treatment program, we have several tools but certainly the majority of our treatment program has to do with Tree of Heaven, so, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, all these different colors do each represent something as a way for us to stay organized and where we are with the process. Unlike other treatment programs of the past, such as Gypsy Moth, which was just a mandatory, like, they're going to spray. They're letting you know, but it's going to happen. This is voluntary. So not only, and, and that's a major challenge, we have to request from, what was it, from 23,000 different, we have to get permission to enter all those properties before we can treat. And, and I think this is a part where I feel like we can help each other because the more that people are aware of these things in advance, the more comfortable they feel signing an agreement and the more they feel like they're 
they're part of something that's really important versus you come up to a door and knock for the first time and they've never heard of it and they and I, and I understand why they're skeptical it makes sense that's a normal way to feel but it's just the more we can do outreach and make it a common like a household topic that will really help so I'm just gonna explain kind of the process how we go through this linearly first of which we survey and establish a treatment area um, each of the red represent a positive and all the greens represent a negative. So what we try to do, this was earlier in the year when the bugs are active and we have all these positive accounts and what we try to do is go back to, especially around the edge, and make sure that we put in a quarter mile buffer. Especially with outlying points, we really hammer that area so that we feel comfortable that yes, in fact, we do know the location of the manifestation. There's always, there's always going to be one you don't find, but at the very least, you feel with some degree of confidence that that is the majority of where the bugs are. Um, so once we get, then we create a map based on that information, which is the one you just saw, and then begins the process of getting all these uh, landowner permissions, and that happens both through direct mailing and door-to-door. -door. Some cases really require a lot of follow-up, depending on the person. I got it. Sorry, there's, there's a lot of buttons on there. Um, almost. This is an example. We have a simplified treatment agreement. There's a copy of it over here, and you're all welcome to take one. But this is what people would sign, just indicating that they're allowing us to serve their property and come back and treat Tree of Heaven if it's present. Um, sometimes you don't get a response at all. Sometimes people say no but we're always hoping for the best that we will get permission at which point we go in and do an inventory. We inventory the tree of heaven because we have two different treatments depending on the size of the trees. So for saplings and anything under five inches DBH gets herbicide. So we remove that tree and then anything above, it's actually five and below and then six and above, right? That's the cutoff. Uh, six and above gets insecticide and that does two things, it creates a trap tree situation, which is a management tool, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it also prevents the creation of hazard trees. Yeah, so this is a trap crop method. The idea would be that you remove, and some people had already mentioned this, you remove the majority of the host, uh, leave behind a few and treat the few with an insect, a systemic insecticide. But, <clears throat> So the, that would be great if that's like, oh, and then they're dead and it's done. But as we know, they, they will occupy a variety of hosts. So we can do all those things and that is a good tool, but it's certainly not enough. You know, it's certainly not going to close all the gaps. Um, this slide, I just want to talk about some other management strategies, some of which we've already mentioned, the use of sticky bands. And actually, if you look out the window right there, that's a big old tree of heaven. And we had a sticky band on that earlier this year to monitor the site because this is a high-risk site for spotted lanternfly. Um, circle traps are another tool. We talked about scraping egg masses is always destroying every life stage you come into contact with. Just this past year, we included the use of botanigard, which is a naturally occurring fungus, Bavaria bassiana. So I always think it's good when we can include something that's either natural or it's organic or those kind of things wherever possible and that happened to be one of those cases. The photo to the right is, was collected from an area where we treated with Bavaria and we did see signs and, um, what do you call, uh, we, when you grow the fungus out, what's it Sporulation. called? Sporulation. Yeah, well, it, yeah, yeah. So we took it to a lab just to confirm, just to make sure it wasn't just like, Culture. oh, a fuzzy, thank you, cultured it, to make sure, and we did have uh, signs that it was working, which is great. This can be a good one as well because they can pass it among each other so you can spray the population and then they can pass it from bug to bug. The conditions do need to be right. It's not without limitations. It can't be too cold. It can't be too hot. There is sort of, and there needs to be a relative amount of humidity. Just uh, currently we are using golden oil and that can be used basically anytime we have a stretch where it's over 40 degrees and to spray egg masses, which then suffocate the egg masses and we're hoping to get approval to use bifenthrin 
and that is something that uh, did I don't, did you get to that part of yours? Bifenthrin is one of the things I recommend for homeowners and other people that they can use on their properties. And then lastly, quarantine. So we're just kind of kind of switch gears and talk about quarantine. Okay, is the bifenthrin uh, are you awaiting approval to use that? because you want to confirm that it works, or is there some other, you know it works, but you're waiting some approval for some no, other reason? We, we know it works, and it would be a good tool because um, it's effective on many life stages. Some of the ones we just talked about, it's like, oh, it's good for egg masses, it's good for adults, but that one's good for many life stages. But we have everything VDEX does, we have to really go through a stringent like risk assessment. So it, we're just, that's pending. They don't take any of this lightly, and nor should they. Like when it comes to applying any kind of pesticide to the environment, we should take it very seriously. So I don't think that's bad, but that's, it's in the works. I think it looks good. I think it will be something we'll be able to use in the coming season, but just hasn't uh, been confirmed yet. So that's the main ingredient in uh, the red and white one that you get off the shelf, and the black and yellow one that you get off the shelf at Lowe's most likely. The spectricide oh, and the ortho. normally like carbaryl and and biofenthrin, right, okay. are the two, yeah, that you would see pretty, pretty readily. And I would just add, too, part of the process, I mean, every pesticide has to be registered and the labels go through approval process with Virginia Department of Ag to be sold and used in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so that's a process the manufacturers go through on an annual basis for those, for all those products. Additionally, um, the products have to be approved by EPA for the, the use on, on those specific insects. And since it's a new invasive, um, there's nothing with spotted lanternfly on its label. Yeah. And, and that's a process to get it through. And researchers try to push that through and expedite it as well um, from USDA and the, and the universities working with the, the chemical companies to, mm -hmm. to get that through the EPA process. Yeah, anybody who deals with pesticides knows that in Virginia the label is a law, so that can be a majorly limiting factor as well. Um, all right, so Winchester and Frederick County are under quarantine, and as Mark already mentioned, spotted lanternfly unfortunately are pretty indiscriminate egg layers. They don't just lay on plants, they like to lay on all kinds of things like rusty metal, so on and so forth. Um, so. As of now, Frederick County is the only county in our state under quarantine, effective as of spring of last year. There are a number of other counties that have quarantines, including, I like to point out, New York has an external quarantine for any areas that have a spotted lanternfly population. You might consider that an indirect effect on businesses and something to really take into consideration when we're having these discussions about how we're going to be impacted. Obviously, is that there's an impact where spotted lanternfly feeds on your crop and it destroys it. Well, there's another impact where people are aware that you have a product within an area that's under quarantine, and that might feed into whether or not they want to get their product from you or somewhere else. So it is of concern on multiple levels. So Amanda, what you're saying there is the market of New York could be a challenge to sell to because of the fact that we are in quarantine here. Right, that's another yeah. reason to care. Yeah, for sure, for sure. They're just the first that has, I, I don't know of anyone else, but they're just the first to do that, but it doesn't mean more states wouldn't follow. And on one hand, to protect themselves and to stop the movement, but at the same time, like, that, that's going to have a negative effect on people who are distributing to that area. Um, the purpose of the quarantine is to prevent artificial spread. Obviously, we talked about the bug. It has legs and it has wings, and it is able to move. But the problem, like the majority of what we're seeing and the problems we're seeing, is because we're moving it. It's not. It's not traveling up and down 11 because it loves that highway. It's not traveling <laughs> out to the left to 50 because it enjoys the road. It's it's going where we go, and so that's why it's of the utmost importance that we are doing visual inspections of our vehicles if we're in the quarantine zone. That we are looking at. Um, materials that are outside. So the the wording of the quarantine is regulated articles, but as you can tell it's purposefully general because in this case they're willing to lay eggs or hang out on any number of materials. Um, so if, essentially if you have anything that hangs out outside for a period of time and then is going to leave the quarantine zone then you should be inspecting it. Uh, and like Madam here like, get into the wheel wells. Those are places where they can hide. And we encourage our team to do that, too. They have flashlights. We encourage them to get down and 
we wouldn't want the next ones we find to be all where we live. That would be very embarrassing. Uh, so just to be vigilant, be thorough. For the permitting process, it's, uh, and I'm sure I've gone through it, it sounds like a few other people in the room have already done it. It's not very difficult. You sign up, it does cost six dollars, and then you basically, I think it's four PowerPoint presentations just covering topics about identifying egg masses, identifying the pest, and so on and so forth. Just like helpful tools to, that you can apply to your business some best management practices and so on and so forth. So you would complete that training along with uh, an application saying that you completed it and then they send you your permit. This website is like the plant industry services website for VDAX and I'll bring that up again at the end. But anytime you need something to do with spot and lantern fly and VDAX, you just, just Google that or uh, you know your favorite search engine, you don't have to Google it, just put in VDAX and Spotted Lantern Flight will take you where you need to go. Say that again, they're not too handy. No, we created a, a page on our website as well that links to all of your resources. Okay. We don't yeah. pretend to be experts, but we can be experts in sharing information with our community. Yeah, so. for sure. And, and certainly, VDAX isn't the only place that has good information. If you go to it, the Ag Extension website, they have a ton of stuff that we don't have. So I think all of that is valuable. I think even Department of Forestry has a publication on the control of um, Tree of Heaven, so the more we can get people that info, the better. Alright, so someone goes through this training and they become the representative, a permit holder. It's then their responsibility if you're a business that has multiple employees to train your other employees. And by doing that, you have a lot of eyes on the ground. You do need to keep some basic records very basic, literally like who got trained, who trained that person, and the date. And that's it. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just shows that it's getting done. Um, and then you can provide a copy of that permit to all those employees. So the, pers the now the trained personnel sort of like the next level. They're the ones who can help conduct these inspections as they've been instructed and provide a copy of the permit and the inspection statement with every load. We have copies of an inspection statement over there. It's on the back of like best management practices for businesses and or citizens, which are very similar. Any, obviously any life stage that's found, destroy. Here's what the inspection statement looks like. It's really basic. It's just a thing to prompt you visually, like this is what you're looking for. Make sure you did it and, it and mark that you didn't find anything, sign and date. And you really, if you wanted, you could laminate this sheet. If you're someone who just is doing local deliveries, like you could laminate it, send it. You have something that goes, I, have, I know personally a farmer in Frederick County who sends a lot of stuff to Shenandoah County. She wanted to just fill that out, send it, and then when the truck comes back, use it the second time, she could do that. But it's just going through the, like, giving the effort to show that you monitored. Um, best management practices, identify like risk pathways for sure, and I feel like this one more than anything touches on don't put your truck or your shipments right under this tree that is potentially full of those bugs because they do fall off and they do end up in there and then they do end up somewhere else. So the more that you can avoid parking under the foliage is helpful. Uh, and not that anyone wants to in the summer, but keeping your windows up and keeping your doors closed because we've had several accounts of hitchhikers, even of people who knew exactly what was going on, who were fully aware of the infestation and might have even been like, work, you know what I mean, like working on that in an area, have gotten to the next destination only to realize that there's a land supply in their car. So that's another thing to be aware of. We already talked about this a bit, just like Tree of Heaven management. You. Other people are free to, and we encourage you to emulate that treatment strategy by removing the majority of the host and then treating the remaining, creating a trap tree situation. Um, and details for treating that you can find. It's the publication is put out by the Department of Forestry, and there's a stack of them over there, and y'all are welcome to take some. Ultimately, it really will, which is why we're having this meeting, it's going to take an effort from a lot of different people. Um, so it's great that we're here talking integrated pest management. It's never just one tool. 
we got to control Atlantis, insecticide where appropriate, egg mass scraping. Oh, on the note of killing spotted lanternfly, there is an app out there, and for those of you who do community events or community outreach, that might be something of interest. It's called Squisher, no E, <laughs> and it was created by a guy in Pennsylvania um, as sort of a fun way to make a maybe a little competition about how many you kill. So that might be something you could incorporate to a day with citizens or something like that. And let's see, visual component, look before you leave. Can't say that enough. And then encourage, I just think, getting the word out, but encouraging people to participate in this program and in the treatment program. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. It's, it's not a hoax. Like, it's, it's a real thing that we really need to do, and, it, and it's free to the person who needs it, or the person within the treatment area. The more people are aware, like I said before, the more likely they are to participate, the more comfortable they feel with the whole topic, the more likely they are to sign these treatment agreements and let us get in there and do what we can do. I think they're more likely to report something if they find it. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's it. Here's some contact information for Tom Carey, the Northern Region Supervisor, Dana, who is back there, and boots on the ground, myself, I'm the inspector for the area. If you see something, you can email it to this address. Mark also covered some ways that you can submit sightings or information. And as always, yeah, just VDAC Spotted Lanternfly. If you search that, you'll find all the things on our website. Mark had mentioned that some of the clusters will attract like honeybees and other bees. So there's a lot of conversation about the honeybee population. We have a lot of hobbyists and other businesses that, you know, um, produce honeybees and honey. So have you all, I know it's new, have any correlation or negative effects that it does have on honeybees or even other predatory bugs? I know Ms. Brudet said they, you know, grow bugs there too. Yeah. Any effect that they have for food competition or anything, or I'm the honeydew, any negative impacts on honeybees? I'm not aware of any negative impacts on honeybees. I, every, anytime it comes up, in my mind, it's from the framework of like, the nuisance idea of having wasps in you know in your yard. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything about literally like the negative effect of bees feeding on that. Mm -hmm. And not in terms of like disease or anything. That could be something that comes out in the future, but yeah, I think there's um, <clears throat> certainly with the systemic insecticide, mm -hmm. there's concern that they're feeding honeydew or they're they're feeding um, on sure. on that oozing sap from the treated tree, so there may be unintended consequences, unfortunately, coming from those treatments. That said, the treatments that VDAX is using in cooperation with the United States Department of Ag um, are very targeted. They're targeted only to Tree of Heaven. They're basal bark applications, so they're basically just spraying the tree trunk at human height. Um, it's not the widespread aerial spraying of the gypsy moth days. Um, so, and that's intentional, um, trying to limit the impact to environment, but there unfortunately will likely be some unintended consequences. Uh, some, some impacts that Pennsylvania has alluded to, this hasn't been teased out with any research, um, but beekeepers in Pennsylvania after this year, this past year, are alluding to off taste in some of their honey, um, hinting at like barbecue or smoky flavor to it from, and, and we don't know if that's from lanternfly or what, but that's what, that's what people are alluding to. Mm -hmm. Good question, really good question. Good question, I, I live in Frederick County, right here at the Clark County and, and West Virginia line. Um, Rappahannock Electric just went through um, a couple months ago and cleared all of those electric lines and I mean, they brought down big trees and little trees and everything else. I mean, and they were just cutting and shredding and doing that kind of stuff. I didn't see anybody looking. I didn't see them. They were just trying to do their job, which I appreciate. We have, you know, electric during the wintertime. But are they? Are you all working with them since they're clean? I mean, we've got the town that's now clearing power lines. We've got the uh, uh, VDOT was just cleaning power lines here and along the roads. Mm -hmm. We have done a training session with VDOT not too long ago. Um, and I know there's been some conversation with Wrapping Hennig Electric. They've been trained. They've even reported findings. So okay. um, and they have the, trained their employees and have been, they have been working. 
Okay. Um, they, and they, okay. yeah, they have, they've them. definitely reported findings. In fact, probably the one that led to the first finding in Clark County was as a result of Rappahannock reporting something okay. that they had okay, seen. So, uh, like, are they looking at every branch? Mm, probably yeah. <laughs> but they're at least aware of it and okay. keeping their eye out. Okay. Yeah, that was a good question, too. Anyone else? So anticipating the, I mean, that one slide that you had, you know, it went from, well, like, 2,000 to 40,000. And, right. and anticipating the continual exponential growth in requirements of this, um, you know, that, that's going to translate to additional resources. And, you know, I mean, are, are you all getting increased revenue? Is there an opportunity for <laughs> local... <laughs> is there, I mean, is there, is there something that we can all do? Because, I mean, this is going to really yeah. require oh, an ongoing, um, you know, effort on all of our parts. And clearly the, the, the economic impact can be profound if, if we don't, you know, if we don't really, yeah. you know, once it goes, it, 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 it's yeah. gone, you right. know. I mean, right. so uh, what, what can we do? Are there additional resources? Do you anticipate that? What can we do? to support you all and then all of, all of us uh, locally as well. I think I could say with uh, confidence, and it's not going to sound good, that we, with the manpower, person power we have, we absolutely will not get to all the properties that we have currently. There's no, I don't even think the limiting factor will be permission, it will just be literally getting enough crews out to do these treatments. Um, I completely agree with you. What will what will that look like? I don't know. And I hope I hope as we bring on board more of these like application options that that's something that we can then translate to bulletins of things people can apply in their own like on their own properties in their own businesses, but I don't have a direct answer. I I think that's the track we need to be on is what are the most tangible steps that we can be taking as individuals or as like community leaders um, but as far as you know having a list for that I think that's just something we we should continue to work on together so currently you're limited by permissions you have the manpower to say yes still when, when people allow you on their property I would, we uh, we even the treatment part is it's a huge amount of space okay. so we would do work, or in the past we've worked with a contractor, um, and yeah, I ju it just depends because we also compete with contractor. Like some of those people work in Pennsylvania too. Some of those same companies that we're trying to get work here have work in Pennsylvania, or they're splitting their time. And anyway, so there's those challenges as well. Yeah. And the whole program's being funded by the USDA. Right. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, that's there's so many agencies involved as well, and that's like its own. It's a good thing, but it's its own coordinating challenge. Sure. Um, I would just comment, kind of looking forward, the reality of the situation, invasive species in general. Um, you know, as much as we would like to stop this, we've seen the trends, we've seen what's happening. The reality is, this is likely going to be a pest. We have to learn to live with to some deal. Um, invasive species will typically ride a pretty strong growth curve and be terrible for a few years and then level out and crash or plateau and come to a more normal population. We've seen that with brown marmorated stink bug um, and other invasive species. We hope that that's what happens with spotted lanternfly eventually, but these first few years, this first decade is not, not going to be fun. Yeah, I would follow that comment to say too, the more that we can take these steps to essentially like contain and suppress, we're not eradicating contain and suppress, is another moment that we can allow science to catch up with where we are. Hope that discoveries are made that, you know, not unlike gypsy moth, that, uh, you know, maybe some fungal impact or some natural, anyway, there's more to be discovered. And the more we can buy time for those options, the better as well. Yeah. Um, I have made some notes on things I wanted to just mention. Uh, I thought your comment about search image was really important because it doesn't really matter what you're looking for until you truly go out and see the thing and then, you know, see it in its environment. 
so maybe we can talk more about having some kind of community events um, in when the weather's nicer so people can come out and see what there is to see for themselves and feel more confident about looking when beyond there. And the other thing that Winchester has done a great job is the work on the website, um, yes. both oh with gosh, the G yes. GIS department and Jen Jenkins, the arborist, mm -hmm. um, worked with me and VDAX and, and pulling resources from both of our organizations and making it available to the general public. You know, mm -hmm. uh, A lot of the public is not going to think to come to Virginia Cooperative Extension necessarily or to Virginia Department of Ag, um, but they may come to their local yeah. government. So any of you in the local governments, I know Frederick County has a page up and um, you said you put one on the regional commission. Um, so other, other counties in the area, we would encourage you um, to get that information out via website if you can. So we, yeah, we, we get 50 hits a month. We're not gonna get the word out directly from our <laughs> website. The people who come to our website are looking for something specific in, in almost every case and it's a lot of people in this room. Um, but we do have some talent in that area, and John Crockett's here, he's soaking up this information, and he's created a story map that's based on the ArcGIS platform, which almost all the communities have. We can publish that story map, and you can embed that in your websites, and we can continue to update that, and it links to your information. It's not new information, mm -hmm. uh, but we can continue to improve that and update it, and as we update it in one place, it will automatically <coughs> update across the region, if that's something that, that the communities want to take advantage of going forward. And if there's something local specific that you want to add it on there, I can make separate things for different localities as well. I think, I, think, um, I think it's helpful for all of us to be aware and, and for those that are doing education and stuff and you know I just know from my own experience and working with you Mark that there are, there are certain times during the life cycle that I think call for us to do more um, pushing of information out to people because mm -hmm. like I just remember when 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 the ones that were on my property were at the NIF stage and I was doing everything I can to, could, to kill them and then as they matured still trying to kill them and then the day that I saw one of them fly to another tree at the adult stage I, I felt I felt so defeated like I felt like I'd been working so hard to like manage these things and had I to do it over again I would have done it in a different way lesson learned. Um, but I think that certainly now we want to do a big push for people to be looking for the eggs. And then mm -hmm. in the early spring when the, when the nymphs start hatching, I think to do like a, a big squisher or whatever, like make it yeah, something yeah. fun that people are constantly looking for. Because if we can get them at the nymph stage or at the, the next stage, right. then they don't get to the adult stage where they're going to be flying and laying eggs. So I just, I, I just think when they get to that place that we've We've kind of, I mean, I felt it. We, I mean, I, I lost. I lost, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, treating them before, you're, you're right, before they can just fly away and before they can put eggs out is just that, the feeling where they get to the egg part, you're just like, oh, like, yeah, that hurts. Oh, we had sort of kicked around the idea of, of doing some more intensive banding, you know, in the nipple stage because they are crawling and be, like they, they will be going up the trees. Um, we had talked about maybe doing a narrow banding to reduce bycatch, but at the same, I mean, they're not going to make it all the way across a band this big, they're tiny, but if you, they, you can cut the bands like in half and then put a narrow band, so I think that might be a good option as just something tangible that you can do, and like you're saying, just really try to knock down from the beginning, you know. And these are the bands that Amanda's talking about, they're sticky bands. Put them around the tree, sticky side out, and whatever crawls up or lands on it gets stuck. Um, the downside to these is they catch a lot of bycatch, unintended insects, mm -hmm. a few small reptiles, <laughs> birds sometimes, bats, yeah. um, other, other small mammals, and that doesn't always um, look good in the public eye. So there's a lot of research and study going on to the circle bands and some other other options. options. Um, the USDA Fruit Research Station in Kearneysville, West Virginia. Um, fortunate or unfortunate, they're 20 minutes from the Winchester population. They have entomologists and um, researchers in Winchester, Frederick County, basically on a daily basis using the area as a, as a research site. 
um, studying things like that and, and other, other tactics. So, like Amanda said, a lot of it is trying to keep it contained and slowed enough that the research and the control options can catch up um, to what we need to deal with. And when you mentioned the permitting uh, for businesses, is that retail businesses or industry? When you drive down the road, you see the industrial park with the big boxes and you wonder what goes on in there. Are these the, the folks who are required, or is it just your small businesses, or, or who all? It's everyone. I would say it's literally everyone who's moving materials outside the quarantine zone. But it's it's pretty inclusive, yeah. So if you're not sure, take the training. You know, like, if you're not sure, you should do it. And, and I think there's no, I mean, I guess there's a $6 cost, but ultimately there's no downside to taking that training. You're just more informed about what's going on. Um, yeah, so everybody that's moving material. The other impact is the way it reads, you know, Interstate 81, obviously a high-risk location, intersects uh, Frederick County along the side of Winchester. So um, transportation, even if it doesn't originate in Frederick County, if that vehicle, the truck stops for more than fuel or the scales, they're supposed to inspect. So that means all these truck parkers now have to go through the permitting process and understand that. And that's been a big hurdle because you mm -hmm. have to notify them nationally. Does that include FedEx and UPS? Any commercial business. Okay. So I work with loggers a lot. And I know when the quarantine first started for Frederick County, I sent out all the information um, to the loggers that had mm -hmm. emails. And I try to print out the information for them on how to get on the website. And some of them, I'm not sure if any of them have gone through the permitting process or not. Uh, but some did comment to me um, to see if there was any kind of like in-person training that they can do. Because a lot of them have problems with technology. And sure. yeah. so that would be a struggle for them yeah. to be able to get on and do the training and get the permitting. So is that... An option. I think I talked to somebody at one point, but I can't remember what the answer was. Eric Day has offered a few. He's our insect ID lab manager and worked on setting up that that module, the online module, with Virginia Department of Ag. It's actually hosted on a Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, website, and a few in-person um, trainings have occurred. Uh, we even just did one early January in Frederick County. Um, but since then, the decision has been made to push everyone to the online option for consistency and um, well, that to, might be again to, to funnel the resources again just because we're, we're only so many people uh, yeah. being able to attack this. So um, maybe that's something you know that you could host, you know, like it doesn't just have to be us, maybe like if you've taken the training, is that. You know, do you feel I, like that's an option, like where she could host for people to? That's a regulatory question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer, but you know, there's, there's a lot of loggers around this area that work. You know, Frederick County, Clark, Warren, you know, up in the northern Chino Valley, and a lot of the wood goes up to Pennsylvania, and you know, so their trucks are going back and forth. And I do know that if they're from Pennsylvania, there's that reciprocity, you know, depend <coughs> training. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. If you get a Pennsylvania permit, we do accept that here. We recognize that in Virginia, so that is good as well. Yeah, but I, mean, I know there's, <coughs> there's mills in and around Winchester and, and Frederick maybe, County, so there's... Maybe we, if we could just exchange information and try to follow up on it and see what we can figure out. And, and if we can figure something out, that'd be something we could offer to other folks. So, um, so the next thing on our agenda is about community outreach, and uh, really I have to thank Felicia uh, for urging me to, to move forward on this and, and get this event together. And I know that she and uh, Warren County are, are passionate about doing some outreach, and uh, so we thought we'd give a few minutes on our schedule to talk about your ideas on how best to do that and uh, how other communities may be able to, to do it as well. We know what Winchester has done and the successes that they've had. Um, we'll be able to support the communities somehow. I think it'll be limited what we're able to do. As I mentioned before, we're not good at going directly to the citizenry. We serve our local governments in order to help you all serve your citizens. So 
if there's a way that we can support that going forward, we will within reason, obviously. But uh, and Jeffrey. Well, thank you, and, and again, thank you all for coming. You know, I, like I say, I live in Frederick County. I've been there for over 40 years, and um, so I see what's happening there. And in the, you know, I, like this is my backyard, and I realize this is my backyard. I'm, I'm here promoting tourism, the Shannon, we've got Skyline Drive, the, the state park. And I, and I really think, you know, I see those tall UPS trucks. I see those tall FedEx trucks that are hitting every tree going down the road as they're delivering packages to everybody's driveway and everybody's yard that they're dropping stuff off. And I thought, there it is. Look, that's how easy it, it can happen. So I think that's, that for me, that was that aha moment, that that is how easy this could spread. Um, you know, th those acres that they showed. And, you know, we can, if we can start working with the school systems, the, with, with that squisher, I mean, that would be great. Those teachers are always looking for things to do and be able to teach their classes. The master gardeners. We have a lot of resources out there. Something, like I said, as simple as putting one of these in our government building so people, the general public sees that and starts looking for it. So there's opportunities. We don't, our goal here today was we wanted to get as many localities as we could here to educate you. And you go back out and disseminate it to your, or your, your different businesses. Invite them to those public meetings. Invite the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. Those, those are the ones that are going to be dragging mom and dad and grandmas out there in the woods looking for those things. So we wanted to make sure we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of information out there, as we've seen. Um, so just take that and run with it. But again, I just and Jeff's got some more information. But thank you for coming today and wanting to learn and try and make a difference as soon as we can. I'm already <clears throat> talking to the converts, so a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be repetitive, but <clears throat> that is actually the first thing I want to talk about is the need for repetition. I've, been, I've worked in political campaigns for 35 years, and there are things that you learn about how to communicate effectively uh, with, with people, and that's really what the outreach program is about. In advertising, there's the rule of seven. That you have to have seven hits of a message to get something out. It's a rule of thumb. Uh, depending on the political campaign, uh, people will say it's either three if you have a very effective communication, or it can be as much as 20 if you have to really uh, hammer it home. But the, the point of it is to, to have repetition. And uh, we've worked on um, uh, health-style health campaigns before, and there's this tendency just to... We're, we'll get it out, and then uh, we'll, we'll let it go. Well, this isn't one of those that you can do that with. You're going to have to do this repeatedly in a variety of different things. Second thing is effective repetition. Uh, there are two parts to that. One is concentrating the times that you do messaging so that it's not just one thing, a month later, something else, a month later, something else. It's not effective. You want to do uh, several things at once. You might... Um, have presentations, and, and these are all things you all know. Presentations, newspapers, electronic media, posters. I love the squisher idea, that was fantastic. Handouts, and, and obviously websites, but continually hammer this home and, and, and make it into an event. Um, it strikes me that one of the best um, and most effective ways to do this is, is using the life cycles. And, and to have your, your um, the, the way that you're doing outreach based on the life cycle. Uh, these things look different in each life cycle. Um, it's like we have aliens here that we, we, that we have to, uh, they, they, they continually morph on us. But that's good because you can use photographs, which is then the next thing you want to do, um, to get across what these messages are, what, what's going to work effectively right then. And then, then the next cycle, you, you have, then here's the next stage of it. And then, you, then you have uh, it where they're obvious to everyone. Um, that, uh, the final two things that I want to talk about uh, just quickly, one is to make it easy for uh, residents to find more information to make reports. Um, it's been pointed out, and I think it's really true, that not everyone uses websites, and not everyone has access to a computer and knows how to do that. So find other ways to uh, make sure that you can, you can uh, let people uh, uh, both identify these things and to report them. Uh, uh, and then finally, uh, and it's been said here already, uh, support legislation to fund control of this because this is going to be a big issue here. So thank you all for coming.
again, thank you all for coming. Uh, if there are any further questions, we'll move forward with that now. Uh, if not, we'll be an hour early. Uh, I would like to I would like to thank the Virginia Inland Port for partnering with us. We yes. love this location. It's a wonderful place. It represents so much more uh, than just the ground that it sits on for our, our region and our community. Uh, Lee Cranford, the relatively new directors here and, and sat in on this as well. I know he's very interested in, in partnering with uh, the communities in the Northern Valley. So uh, meet him if you haven't. And thank you all for coming. Let me know if we can serve you. That's why you created us. Take care.